Hello, and welcome to the Westminster Institute. I'm Robert Riley, its director. Today, it's my great pleasure to welcome back to the Westminster Institute an American Renaissance man, David Goldman. David is an economist, financial analyst, music critic. Actually, more than that, he's a music theoretician. David is also a prolific author. He is best known for his series of online essays in the Asia Times under the pseudonym Spengler. He is the Wax Family Fellow at the Middle East Forum and a senior fellow at the London Center for Policy Research. His analyses of global events are highly regarded. Here's a sample from Herbert Mayer, former CIA National Intelligence Council Vice Chairman. He said, quote, ask anyone in the intelligence business to name the world's most brilliant intelligence service, and we will all give the same answer, Spengler. David Goldman's Spengler columns provide more insight than the CIA, MI6, and Mossad combined, unquote. David previously spoke at the Westminster Institute on the subject of, will China overtake the US as the world's leading superpower? One of our most viewed videos with over 100,000 views. Another talk uh, was given on his latest book, You Will Be Assimilated, China's Plan to Sinoform the World. And most recently, David spoke on the topic, Western survival depends on the sacred. David's also the author of How Civilizations Die and Why Islam is Dying. And it's not the end of the world, it's just the end of you the great extinction of nations. Today, David will be speaking on the economic consequences of the Russia-Ukraine war. David, welcome back. Bob, it's uh, a real pleasure and honor to be back with you. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. I have to say regarding Herbert Meyer's effusive praise that uh, doing better than if government intelligence agencies is a low bar because spies are paid to tell their masters what they want to hear and not what they really think. So, you know, if you're not being paid by a government, it's not hard to do better. David, you have been speaking on the Russia-Ukraine conflict, and in one aspect is on, let's say, the unintended effects of Western sanctions. What are the economic consequences, the unforeseen economic consequences of this war? Well, we see that every day at the gas pump and elsewhere. I think there's, there's a short term and a long term. The short term problem, obviously, is higher energy and raw materials prices, particularly for food. The long term problem is the threat to the dollar status as the linchpin currency of the international monetary system. I don't think we're going to see anything happen in that long term regard for a year or two, because everybody is so deeply bought into the dollar monetary system, particularly the Chinese, that nobody wants to see it go down. Uh, but everybody's making preparations as an alternative. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain. When President Biden imposed and persuaded other countries to impose sanctions on Russia, he tweeted, I believe it was April 4th, that Russia's economy would be cut in half and Russia would not even be among the world's 20 top economies. It's now among the top 10 with an economy roughly the size of Italy or Texas. No such thing happened. The Russian economy has taken a substantial hit. The International Monetary Fund thinks that it will shrink by about 8% this year, but by the standards of the kind of pain that Russia has sustained in terms of economics since the fall of communism. That's something, well, that's not going to uh, deter Putin and is not going to cause a mass uprising against his regime. We already had an energy shortage in the works when the war started. The oil price had risen into the 80 to $90 a barrel range uh, by February uh, 24th when Putin began his reprehensible invasion of Ukraine. That was 
largely due to American policy errors. The American oil output had fallen by about 20% during the COVID period, partly because of COVID, but even more because the Biden administration started a witch hunt against oil drilling under pressure from the radical progressive environmentalist wing of his party, uh, which discouraged uh, the majors and uh, independents uh, from drilling oil. We'd had a boom in American oil drilling. America had become a major oil exporter, largest oil producer in the world during the Trump administration. Uh, after a year of Biden, uh, we were now importing oil again. So the market was already somewhat squeezed. And by pushing oil off the market, we got to prices now in the $110, $120 range. Uh, we have been higher and it's likely prices will go higher unless of course we have a world recession and people stop driving their cars, in which case the oil price might go down a bit, but that's not the kind of way we want to see the oil price go down because it means people are suffering. Even worse, what the sanctions did in the short term was to create a two-tier oil market because contrary to our expectations, India fell off the bandwagon and began importing Russian oil massively, and China became a major importer of Russian oil. Now, we don't know exactly how much they're importing, but most of the analysts who look at this believe that Asia has taken up all the Russian oil that Russia cannot sell to the West because of sanctions. And of course, the Europeans have made exceptions for themselves because they're heavily dependent on Russian oil as well as Russian natural gas. So for Europe, that's meant inflation of the 8% range, which they haven't seen since World War II. In the way Germany measures inflation, energy is a much larger component of their consumer price index than it is here, but it's certainly hurting people badly. Gasoline at the 5 to $6 range at the pump is a major hardship for many American families. At the same time, China and India are buying discounted oil from Russia, which means they're paying the old price. The countries which refused to go along with the sanctions regime or pretended to go along but are buying energy under the table are getting a break. So Putin is building up political chips with India, which has been Russia's uh, ally for decades, really since uh, the 1950s. Uh, China is cementing its relationship with Russia and the West is suffering. Now, as in response to this, the central banks of the West are raising interest rates. Now, this is not going to do anything, in my view, to reduce inflation. There are times when interest rates are the right cure for inflation, times when it's not. Back in the 1970s, Paul Volcker raised interest rates drastically, federal funds rate went up to close to 20% briefly. That's when we had inflation of 11% the last time we were in this kind of mess. But that was the circumstance, Bob, where everyone in the market was borrowing all the money they could from banks and buying all the hard assets they could on the theory that hard assets would continue to increase in price and you'd pay back your loans in cigar coupon money. That's when uh, private equity and leveraged buyouts became popular because you'd buy companies with real assets and you'd issue debt, but the real cost of debt service would fall because of inflation. That was also a great housing. Uh, all through the 1970s with inflation, uh, for ordinary investors, housing was the one asset class that generated positive returns. Stocks went down, bonds went down, cash had negative returns, but houses kept going up. So there was huge incentive on the part of borrowers to get all the debt they could and to buy hard assets. And that created an inflationary spiral driven by credit. So when Paul Volcker cut the credit, that had a big effect. At the same time, Ronald Reagan of blessed memory introduced the biggest tax cut in US history, which brought an enormous amount of supply onto the market. People worked harder, people started businesses. And the increase of supply met a reduced amount of money in circulation, and the result was a very rapid cure for inflation in common with economic growth. Nothing like that is happening today. 
this is a very specific kind of shock. We had two stages of inflation. First, the Federal Reserve expanded its balance sheet by $6 trillion, and the U.S. government took its spending up to 30% of gross domestic product. That's an astonishing number. All through the last 40 years, uh, government spending as a percent of GDP in good times and bad varied between about you know, 70 to 23%. It was roughly 20%. Then with the COVID pandemic, the massive $6 trillion stimulus pushed us up to 30% of GDP. Now, fair enough, Donald Trump started this. But Donald Trump did this when the economy was completely prostate, people were hunkered down in their homes, you couldn't buy paper towels, nobody would go to work, the subways were empty, uh, midtown Manhattan looked like a ghost town, you needed an emergency measure given the external shock of the pandemic. The economy had already begun to recover pretty nicely by the time Joe Biden was elected and Joe Biden doubled down on the stimulus. Now, uh, that's like taking a guy who's having a heart attack or his heart has stopped for whatever reason, you inject him with adrenaline. Then you know, he gets up, he's up in ambulatory, and then you inject him with the same dose of adrenaline again. It's not gonna have a very good effect. That's what Biden did. Instead of using the stimulus for emergency purposes, he offered a gigantic handout to democratic constituencies. So it's the doubling down on the stimulus which created the inflation. So the Federal Reserve remembering that in uh, rate, higher interest rates brought down inflation in the late 1970s and early 1980s said, well, we'll do the same thing again. Federal Reserve reminds me of the New Guinea cargo cults after World War II. If you recall, there were Neolithic peoples who saw American aircraft bringing cargo during the war. They built air bases and planes landed and all these wonderful things came out of the planes. And then of course, after the war, the Americans packed up and left, the planes stopped coming. So <clears throat> the Neolithic peoples built airfields and they built uh, airplanes out of grass and they built you know, control towers out of grass, thinking that if they built these totems, cargo, would return. Now, that's basically what the Fed's doing. They're, they're doing uh, what made sense under Folger and Reagan, but makes absolutely no sense now. So whatever problems we have, the Federal Reserve has compounded them by applying the wrong kind of medicine. How does this play into the now soon to be seventh round of sanctions we have put on Russia? and our oh. constraining of the oil market and our uh, sanctioning uh, the sales of Russian gold. And what was the most recent thing? Apparently, uh, there's going to be an attempted G7 cap on the price of Russian oil. I don't know how they, they would yeah, so the, Bloomberg had a good laugh at this this morning, as did the Wall Street Journal. The financial press rang up a bunch of economists who said, well, this is silly. What possible motive do, for example, the uh, Chinese or the Indians have to go along with a cap? Why would buyers accept a cap? Uh, this was a brainchild of a couple of uh, very bright people, Mario Draghi and Janet Yellen, uh, which is going nowhere. The basic problem is that the world is so beholden to Russian energy in a tight market, and the market is tight, as I said, largely because of Biden's uh, environmentalist fanaticism. In that type market, if the Russians don't provide energy uh, oil to large parts of Western Europe, large parts of the Western Euro European economy will shut down. So Putin, since the invasion, has made more money than ever. $93 billion in 100 days after February 24th, according to a Finnish think tank study. Uh, record oil, uh, oil revenues for Russia, so Russia has no problem sourcing things that it needs, no problem financing the war, and the political pressure on Western European governments is enormous. Now, Putin gave a speech a couple of weeks ago in which he boasted, you think you're gonna depose me? No. 
the Western elites are going to go down. We're going to get new elites because of your blunders. And that, of course, is the danger that you have a political breakup of data because the pressure on governments due to the economic hardship is going to make some of these governments extremely unpopular. Now, if Russia continues to shut off gas deliveries to, to Germany, Germany is getting only the, about 40% of the level of gas it would expect to store up for the winter. And you have a winter where industry shut down for lack of gas and some people are actually cold and the average family is heavily burdened, there will be a political problem in Europe. According to a calculation by the German newspaper Die Welt, the average German household is going to be paying in 2022 about $3,000 a year more for home heating alone, not counting gasoline, than it did in 2020. That's, for many households, an impossible situation for the bottom 20% of German households. That's an extreme hardship. So Germany is already talking about gas rationing, and you may have significant unemployment. Look at the French elections a couple of weeks ago. Emmanuel Macron was uh, forced out of his majority in parliament by the right and the left. The, uh, the right under the National Front and the Marine Le Pen gained uh, the largest number of votes in history and the left coalition, which is also sympathetic to Putin, gained enough votes so that there is effectively an anti-NATO majority in the French parliament. That doesn't uh, throw Macron out of office, but it does constrict him. In Germany, even before this latest surge in gas prices, and the threat of a shutdown of large parts of the economy and real hardship because of lack of natural gas. Even before that, uh, the Social Democratic Party of Olaf Scholz, the chancellor, the governing party, was losing state elections one after another by the largest margins in its history. The opinion polls in both Germany and France show a lot of doubt about NATO policy. The most important opinion poll in Germany show that two thirds of Germans were against sending heavy weapons to Ukraine. So the uh, support for the war was shaky to begin with and the economic blowback of the sanctions could very well uh, break up NATO. Now, the reading that we got from most of the press from the Group of Seven meeting that just occurred in uh, Bavaria a couple of days ago Wall Street Journal reports today that uh, leaders were very divided, uh, not happy about the idea of additional sanctions, which is why the kind of sanctions they talked about are these unworkable things like the cap on Russian oil prices and so forth. The strains were shown in the coalition. So instead of having the great rally of NATO around the cause of Ukrainian sovereignty against you know, the evil Russians, which so many American politicians have talked about, we may have instead uh, a breakup of NATO, a, dis a decisive weakening of NATO. And I think if that happens, it'll be our own fault because we got ourselves into a fight that we weren't prepared for, and we vastly overestimated our economic power. That's the short-term side of it. Uh, and it's uh, painful for everybody who you know, has to heat a house or fill up a car or go to the supermarket. It could get a great deal more painful, and those political consequences will play out uh, in a way that will not be pleasant for the leaders who got us into this. Reinforcing what you said about Germany, David, uh, there was a recent Wall Street Journal article about BASF, one of the largest chemical corporations in the world which is in Germany and has at least a score of factories there, saying that uh, if natural gas is sanctioned uh, in the winter and they receive, uh, I forget the percentage of, uh, you know, less than what they need to power their factories, they will have to shut down, which will cause enormous unemployment. They're a major fertilizer producer, so that has effects downline. Uh, in, in harming agriculture. 
And I imagine the political repercussions inside Germany will be enormous should that happen, along with what you said, the normal uh, household paying a, a great increase in their heating bill. Now, President Biden recently said that referring to the sanctions and how much uh, the West is suffering from them uh, as against the effects of these sanctions internally on Russia, that this is a waiting game. In other well, words, who's, who's going to say, ouch, first? Yes. Uh, we don't really know what's happening inside Russia. The Western media is not well represented inside Russia, but uh, there is no indication of significant popular unrest. Um, there have not been mass arrests, mass demonstrations. There have been a number of opinion polls by independent agencies. One never knows how candid people will be with pollsters uh, under these kinds of conditions, uh, but none of it has suggested that there is a upsurge of outrage against Putin, quite the contrary. The first response of Russians is to rally around their government, feeling that the West is treating them uh, unfairly. Um, I have no grief for Putin. I think he's a bad guy. Uh, dealing with him is like dealing with Luca Luciano. His role in Russia is capo di tutti capi. But nonetheless, he seems to have that domestic situation well under control. And from people who have been to Moscow, from Asia Times, own correspondent in Moscow. The restaurants are full. There are a lot of goods in the stores. You can't buy Louis Vuitton handbags and a lot of other things are missing. Uh, but the average shopper is not unduly burdened by this. Russia, of course, depends on many foreign components for its industry, semiconductors, for example, but there's a good deal of evidence that countries like Turkey, Azerbaijan, and others who have not agreed to the sanctions are acting as intermediaries. Russia imported roughly $100 million of microchips in 2020. Not a great deal. If you, you know, offer double the price, which they can easily do given their oil revenues, they'll get all the chips they need for quite a period of time. It's very hard to enforce sanctions on a commodity low-end computer chips of the kind that guide Russian artillery shells or control Russian industry. So there's no guarantee that we're gonna win the waiting game. Everything we've seen suggests that the estimates of Western governments were vastly exaggerated in terms of the vulnerability of the Russian economy. Germany's developed the center-right daily ran an article a couple of days ago under the headline, The Astonishing Resilience of the Russian Economy, in which they argued that Putin's been preparing for this for a very long time. Uh, Russia, for example, seems to have no shortage of artillery shells. From most of the reports we read, uh, Russia's uh, firing rate is between 15 and 40 times that of the Ukrainian army. Uh, I'm told by sources in Russia that the armaments factories are running 24 hours a day, three shifts, nonstop, uh, and they do not have a shortage of ammunition, of course. You know, one never knows. On the other hand, we do know that the Ukrainians are very short of ammunition. A British think tank, the uh, Royal United Services Institute, published a report last week in which they calculated that in 10 days, the Ukrainian army fires off artillery shells equal to the entire annual production of artillery shells in the United States. So if the Ukrainians are indeed running short of ammunition, as many reports suggest, it's likely to be the case that the storehouse of the West is inadequate to replace them. There's a, an Austrian military analyst, uh, Colonel Markus Reisner, who's been frequently quoted in the press and uh, news media. The Austrians are neutral, so they'll say whatever they you know what they like. Reisner's argument is that Ukraine cannot possibly win a war of attrition against Russia. So the waiting game 
will not necessarily go our way. And the probabilities, to the extent we have information, I emphasize that any information we have is incomplete and sketchy and to some extent suspect. But the, the indications we have are that the war of attrition is going the wrong way now. So we may end up having worse economic consequences in the West than Russia suffers and uh, lose the war uh, on top of it. So the effect in terms of credibility of the United States as a military power, as a world leader, the credibility of NATO would be uh, devastating. Many analysts are trying to come to uh, grips with that. Uh, for example, the lead of today's Asia Times is an essay by my friend Seth Cropsey, who was a senior naval official in the George W. Bush administration, distinguished military analyst. His argument is that we need to put all the firepower we can into Ukraine, because even if Putin wins, even if he succeeds in grinding through the country, as Cropsey put it, we will be better off having made the effort in terms of NATO credibility than if we cut and run right now. Now, when we get down to that kind of alternative, I'm, I'm really sad because the implication is we should fight a losing war with tens of thousands of additional deaths and incalculable destruction in order to maintain our credibility because to give up now would make us look even stupider. That's the logic that the European powers pursued in 1915 and 1916. They got into a war they didn't want. They realized they couldn't win it uh, by the means they thought they could. They were stuck in it. They were being ground up. But as a matter of credibility, they felt they had to pursue the war. And the result was the worst catastrophe probably ever for Western civilization, uh, the First World War. Uh, that's the short term. Then there's the long term consequences, which could be really, really scary for us. Uh, and I emphasize long term because I don't think there's going to be a dollar crash or a financial crisis or anything like that in the next year or two. But the whole point of a reserve currency is convenience, freedom, and rule of law, reliability. The United States is in an odd kind of position. We run a trade deficit now, what, about a trillion and a half dollars a year? We've been running a trade deficit for more than 30 years. I, I, I have to go check the old data, but the result is we end up importing goods from people, goods and services, more than we sell them. And the difference, we give them in our paper. We give them our IOUs, we sell them assets, stocks, real estate, or whatever. So our net balance, what's called our net foreign asset position, the sum of all the paper we've given to foreigners in lieu of the goods that we're buying from them, is now $18 trillion negative. We're $18 trillion in the, in the hole to the rest of the world. Now, for a long time, people would say, well, what's wrong with that? Look at our giant tech companies. Look at Microsoft and Google and Apple and Tesla and all these wonderful companies, Netflix, um, maybe not so much anymore. Uh, we have the tech miracle. We've, we invented the internet. We invented Facebook and social media, all these great things that we've got, people want to invest in. Well, that worked for a while, but we had something of a speed bump this year in tech stocks. The question we have to ask ourselves is, how long will the rest of the world continue to want to take our paper in lieu of goods at asset values, which are, let's say, heavily really generous, if not, you know, an outright bubble. Now, on top of that, we did something which no one ever did outside of a declaration of war, namely to seize roughly half of the foreign exchange reserves of Russia, about $300 billion worth of Russian reserves. Uh, we talk about a rule-based order, but I'm not sure under what rule we have the right to seize Russian foreign exchange reserves. If we had a declaration of war, if we were at war with Russia, well, certainly that would be enemy assets. And under international law, a warring power may seize enemy assets, but we're not at war 
We saw of an embassy open in Russia. So what judge signed a decree giving the, um, the US government the right to seize $300 billion of someone else's property? Now, from the standpoint of other countries who have large amounts of money invested in the United States, that's a deal breaker. Our largest single investor is Japan. The Japanese are an ally, so I don't think they're worried about it. They joined the sanctions. But then we have China, which has, what, about three and a half trillion dollars worth of American paper. We have the Arab countries, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. From the standpoint of Saudi Arabia, whom President Biden has denounced as a human rights abuser, and probably with some reason, uh, their enormous reserves, the hundreds of billions, well, if the United States decides that they don't like Saudi Arabia for whatever reason, they could be subject to the same kind of problem. So we see that the Saudis beginning to put money into Chinese currency. They're diversifying away. We see the Chinese creating what they call a liquidity facility in their own currency, the RMB, at the Bank for International Settlements. At the BRICS subtle last week, BRICS being uh, uh, an acronym for Brazil, Russia, India, and China, the largest uh, non-Western economies, uh, there was a proposal to create a BRIC reserve currency, to create a basket of currencies among uh, those participants independent of the West. The Chinese and the Russians have created messaging systems for international bank transfers that allow them to bypass in an emergency the standard American dominated system for international transfers, that's SWIFT or the Society for Worldwide International Financial Communications. Uh, there was talk of shutting the Russian banking system out of SWIFT. Uh, Janet Yellen wisely pulled back on that because we don't want, we probably don't want to know what would happen if we did that, whether the rest of the world could deal without us. Uh, there is di significant diversification of reserves out of U.S. dollars. Now, the United States has, as I mentioned, net uh, net foreign asset position of negative 18 trillion. Uh, world central banks have, what, about $10 trillion worth of our paper. Uh, the world banking system has about $16 trillion worth of dollar deposits, which people use to finance international trade. All that money gets lent to American homeowners, American businesses, American consumers, and of course, to the US government, which has been the biggest borrower in the last few years. What happens if the rest of the world does not feel like lending us money or demands a much higher risk premium? Well, when our national debt is $30 trillion and our gross domestic product is $23 trillion, uh, every 1% rise in interest rate is going to cost us 1.3% of GDP. And the burden on debtors are, um, it, it could be really serious. Uh, we could become Italy, where we pay a very high risk premium to borrow money, and we have to undertake austerity measures. Worst comes to worst, we could have a run out of the dollar into gold or other assets. Uh, and a disorderly breakdown of American financial markets. Now, as I said, I don't think this is going to happen. People talk about, what if the Chinese dump the dollar? Well, Chinese own three and a half trillion dollars. Why should they blow up their own portfolio? The Chinese also are exporting roughly $700 billion a year of goods to us. That's, you know, that, that, that compares to about $400 billion when Donald Trump put the tariffs in. So that, that American market has been very good to the Chinese, even if they think there are alternatives to it. There aren't short-term alternatives, and the result of a collapse of the dollar and American purchasing power would be to increase Chinese unemployment. So I don't see the Chinese, who are cautious, strategic players, doing something rash. As I said, this is not a short-term issue. But if we keep going down this road, uh, it may become an issue in two or three years, and we may have a really 
nasty kind of situation, uh, the kind the British had when the pound sterling ceased to be a reserve currency, which is high inflation, low currency, austerity budgets, and much lower living standards. David, you mentioned that uh, the seizure of the foreign reserves of a sovereign country is a, is a unique thing to do with a nation at which one is not at war. Now, uh, Russia has been forced into the first default on international debt in more than a century, even though it has the money to pay those debts. Well, how does that fit into the picture? Well, you know, somebody on the internet said, uh, if a country defaults in a forest, and there's no rating agency to hear it. Is, that, is it really a default? It's a technical default because the US government prevented American banks from transferring Russian money to its bondholders. Uh, Russia is swimming in money. It is a net lender to World Bank. It's not a net borrower. For the foreseeable future, Russia will be swimming in money. So it has absolutely no need to borrow. It can't borrow because of the sanctions. Uh, and it has the money to pay, wants to pay. The money that's the US government is basically said, your money's not good here. So we're going to declare you in default. That's really a technical and symbolic issue. It has no real impact on the strategic situation. Uh, just to refer to a couple of other items regarding the impact within Russia, it's a prediction that the Russian uh, economy will decline more than 11% this year. Um, a Russian uh, blogger who's still allowed to operate uh, writes that um, auto production in Russia now is 15% of what it was you know, on February 23rd before the invasion. She also maintains that there's a 12% decline in wholesale trade in Russia and a 17% decline in retail trade. You've talked about the, the, the near term and the long term. Some predict that the real bite of sanctions on Russia uh, will, will hit midterm, that it's next year when they'll be hurting more for it. And they also mentioned such things as the brain drain that the war with Ukraine has occasioned in Russia. Uh, not only many of the wealthy Russians have fled to Turkey and uh, the Gulf, but young, talented people have, have left too because opposition to that war. What do you think? I simply don't have enough information to make a top-down evaluation. Uh, the International Monetary Fund's estimate was uh, about an 8% reduction in output this year. Uh, I would not be surprised if the number were 11%. I wouldn't be surprised if it were 6%. Um, a great deal depends on how Russia's trade relations develop. Right now, for example, China could do an enormous amount to integrate Russia into its economy. The Russian economy is the size of one Chinese province. So China could swallow it fairly easily. And China certainly has virtually everything Russia needs for you know, its industrial capacity. The Chinese have been laying very low. Um, Russia's... Uh, uh, imports from China rose spectacularly right up to the invasion, uh, nearly doubled, and then they dropped off again, uh, back to uh, you know previous levels. So they you know, they fell by more than half. They fell by about half, and I think that's because the Chinese are very wary of secondary sanctions. Uh, I've talked to a number of Chinese companies, uh, Chinese high tech companies, which had major operations, including research facilities, have pulled in their horns and steered clear of Russia because they don't want to come into the American gun. Uh, there's a lot of controversy about how China views this war, and that's a critical issue from Russia's standpoint, uh, given their economic weight in this. Um, it's interesting that the foreign ministry official who specialized in Russia-Chinese relations, who arranged the 
great Xi Jinping uh, Putin get together right before the war started uh, was fired a couple of weeks ago. There are some suggestions that uh, China is not happy about Putin rocking the boat. It has its own fish to fry. It doesn't want a confrontation with the United States right now. It has its own problems at home. So it's somewhat put out at uh, what Putin has done and reluctant to go all in in terms of support, particularly what it might call secondary sanctions down upon China. So the Chinese have enormous leverage as to the Indians and others, just given the size of the Russian economy, uh, feeding the microchips into Russia, the raw materials they need to deal with their uh, industrial problems is a relatively trivial problem. They do have other problems, for example, Siemens, for whom uh, Russia was one of their top customers, maybe their top customer. Siemens was providing industrial software for a large number of Russian factories. Siemens is now no longer working in Russia. So uh, they're not gonna get software updates and that could be a, a serious problem. Uh, the brain drain has been significant, but not crippling. So it's very hard to get out of Russia right now. Not that many people can emigrate. Uh, so you have a lot of Russians who've gone to Armenia where they can still travel. Uh, hard to go to China because of the COVID restrictions. So perhaps when the war is over, you're going to have a flood of people leaving, but it's simply not been possible for that many people to leave. Um, Armenia is probably going to emerge as a great center of software because of all the Russian emigrants. Now, there's one uh, very dire economic consequence, which we haven't addressed so far. Uh, there is a drought in Ethiopia, in Somalia, and Kenya. Uh, Africa receives some 40% of its grain from Russia and Ukraine. The figure in Egypt is startling. It's 85% of its grain. Uh, and of course, sunflower oil and other items. NATO, the United States, is accusing Russia of weaponizing food. Russia, on the other hand, simply counters with the same accusation that it is we who are weaponizing food. And it seems that a number of these countries that will suffer the most from this are taking not necessarily the Russian side, but they are saying that, look, it's your sanctions that are imperiling us in this way. Yes, well, I think that I think the truth is both sides are weaponizing food. Um, this is a, a prospective disaster. A lot of people will starve. And Russia is cold-bloodedly playing this. But from the standpoint of most people in the global south, the American concept of rules-based order or the issue of Ukrainian sovereignty is a very remote kind of thing. Uh, Two thirds of the world's countries did not vote for sanctions. The vast majority of the world countries representing uh, such as they do, the, uh, the vast majority of the world's people are outside the sanctions regime. That's virtually all of Latin America, uh, virtually all of Africa and most of Asia, most importantly, India, which is the world's largest democracy. It's certainly no friend of China, if not an American ally, it pursues its own course. So to the extent that the politics of this have played out against us, uh, I think it's because the global South has never really identified with the cause of the United States uh, as we would like them to do. Certainly uh, India is a disappointment uh, to American diplomacy. On the other hand, what does the voice of Ethiopia count? in the councils of the world. I don't mean to be cynical about this. Human life is human life and loss of a human life in Ethiopia is as tragic as it is anywhere else. But Ethiopia doesn't have a lot of cards to play. Uh, the most important issue we should be worrying about strategically is India, which of course is a food exporter. They're not affected by this. Um, you know, China can, or Russia or the BRICS can 
to clear all the coalitions of countries of the global south if they want, it won't make a great deal of difference to them. It may help China market their telecommunications equipment in Brazil or Argentina, for example, but that's a marginal issue. The real strategic issue, which we need to worry about, is the possibility that India ceases to be an active supporter of the United States in our strategic objectives in Asia. That would be a major blow. Well, but what about the, the substance of this issue of the uh, uh, of so many tens of millions of people at risk due to the grain shortages? One source said that because of the sanctions, uh, Russia is having trouble exporting its grain because uh, the the shippers can't get insurance. Or they don't want to pay the premium for the insurance. Yes. One would think that it would be a humanitarian gesture on the part of the United States to find a way to get the grain to people who require it. Russia is not going to run out of money because of the grain issue. They're already making more money out of energy sales than they require to pursue the war. And our efforts to stop that have been completely misguided. So to the extent that our sanctions are a contributor, as I said, both sides have weaponized grain. Well, supposedly, according to the State Department, the United States has already said sanctions do not apply to the export of food. But to my knowledge, food is not getting out uh, in the Black Sea, either from Russia or Ukraine. Am I correct in that? Compression, do you know? That, that's correct. Part of the problem is the Black Sea has been mined, and the Russians have asked the Ukraine to demine the ports. It's a military zone. Now, it's possible they could do it themselves. I, this is an area where I'm technically challenged. It may be possible for Russia to do that themselves, uh, as opposed to demanding a concession from Ukraine. It's possible that Russia does not require this and is simply using this as an excuse, I really can't judge that. But one thing that the leaders of the world should be able to do, given that the grain is there and people need it, is find a way to get it there, whatever else happens in this miserable war. Well, as you know, they're trying to move it by rail with the problem that Russia, including Ukraine, has a different gauge of... uh, rail tracks than the rest of Europe. So it has to be unloaded, loaded, taken to Romania, shipped from there, which is own, won't even put a dent in the problem in the terms of the millions and millions of tons of, of grain that's in Ukrainian islands. Yeah. Rail is a problem. Uh, just to give you an example, the total rail traffic between Russia and China in 2020 was about not quite 600,000 container equivalents. A container will hold about 23 tons of grain. And by my arithmetic, even if China and Russia did nothing but ship grain and use that same capacity, that would only cover a fifth of China's imports of grain. It's it's simply not efficient to use rail traffic to uh, ship grain. That's something you need to do with ships. You simply don't have enough containers to do that. So you'd have to get shipping in. And of course, the problem with Ukraine at the moment, getting anything out is that there's a war going on in the Black Sea. The Ukrainians are sinking Russian ships. They successfully sank the Moskva, the uh, uh, cruiser, which was the flagship of the uh, Russian Black Sea fleet. The Russians didn't say much about it, but their response, according to a number of American Navy analysts I've spoken to, will be to try to uh, wipe out all Ukrainian missile capacity on the Black Sea coast. That means taking Mykolaiv in the south and then eventually trying to take Odessa. So as long as there's a war going on in the south, it's going to be very difficult to get grain through. David, of course, it's not just an economic consequence. It's a direct consequence of the war. The prediction that the economy in Ukraine uh, is going to decline by more than 45% this year. 
know, Ukraine is in a really difficult position. Remember, Ukraine with uh, on paper had 45 million people before the war started, but there were only actually 33 million in the country because 12 million were working outside the country. Um, a few came back, a lot more left. There are probably a lot fewer than 33 million in the country because of 5 million refugees. They re much more than the reflow. So let's say there are 25 million people. Uh, the infrastructure damage is probably going to be in the range of what, a trillion dollars by most estimates. Now that's in a country with a gross domestic product of 160 billion pre-war and maybe a hundred billion. So you're talking about a repair bill of 10 times gross domestic product. That would be the equivalent in the United States of $200 trillion. I don't see the Western democracies coughing up a trillion dollars to uh, repair Ukraine. So my guess is large parts of the country will end up being depopulated, ruined for many, many years, perhaps permanently. Ukraine already had an extremely low birth rate. Its population was shrinking. Very large number of people working overseas. I think many of the refugees will never come back. They won't have anything to come back to. So we'll be like the uh, a fictional uh, US Army officer who was quoted by uh, that horrible CNN reporter. I can't remember his name offhand. Uh, in, in Vietnam, it was it became necessary to destroy the village in order to save it. That was never said, but we may end up destroying Ukraine in order to save it for real, and that would be an unspeakable tragedy. Which brings up my last question: What does this look like at the end? What is the most likely outcome, and where does it leave Ukraine? Where does it leave us and Russia? As you know. Uh, Putin has been repeatedly referred to by President Biden as a war criminal. Uh, and other leaders have used uh, similarly harsh language. You don't usually negotiate with a war criminal. Um, and by any measure, as Putin said some time ago, uh, we are at economic war with Russia. And you pointed out very specifically in what way that that is true. Um, so as I have listened to and examined the various sides to, to this question, no one seems to have the answer of how this unwinds and what it looks like at the end and what kind of approach uh, can bring negotiations about uh, that will bring about an end. I mean, right now it seems that a military, decisive military advantage on one side or the other is, is the only thing at the moment. What do you think? I think that we'll need different people to make peace. Uh, I think we'll have a change in administration in the US in 2024. Uh, if Donald Trump comes back, he'll be able to take a fresh approach. He's been very unspecific about what he would do. Uh, but Trump is a tough negotiator, but not a regime changer. He doesn't want Putin out of office. He's willing to deal with him. Uh, Putin at some point is also going to have to leave. He's been there too long. Putin has been grooming any number of provincial governors who the West doesn't know, uh, like obscure state governors in the US as prospective successors. The easiest thing would be for a new president, untainted by Biden's uh, extravagant language about Putin as a war criminal, to come in uh, in a couple of years, and for Putin to resign, declare that his war objectives have been met after taking the Donbas and maybe some parts of the Black Sea coast, uh, and let someone come in who's completely fresh, untainted by the war issue, and then peace can be made. Uh, my guess is the war of attrition will go on. The Russians have found a formula they like, which is to use artillery to grind up the Ukrainian cities and take small pieces of strategic territory. Um, 
I think it's highly probable that at some point the Russians will say, well, we got what we want. Uh, the Ukrainians will be unable to throw them out. So they'll sit there glowering each other for a year. And at some point, new leaders will come in who will be able to negotiate without the baggage of the Biden administration or indeed Putin himself. So, so I think speaking. it will be a two or three year process. Which means a lot of interim damage as the war continues. Um, well, yes, I, I, absolutely tragic. I mean, one thing I've got to say, Bob, is that every American diplomat who knew this situation, from Henry Kissinger to William Burns, said repeatedly, Ukraine's NATO membership was a red line for Russia. We better not do it, we you know, get into violence. Then when Ukraine got to the point of being considered for NATO membership, Putin reacted in the violent way he did. Every American commentator said, you see Putin is an imperial fantasist who wants to restore Russian glory and so forth. We forgot everything we had been saying about it for a dozen years. So I think there were missteps, gro gross missteps on the American side, not to condone Putin who, who did something illegal and horrible, but you know, you bait the bear and you get bitten by the bear. To some extent, you well, you shouldn't have been baiting the bear. So I think our 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 leaders, particularly the Biden administration, deserve a great deal of blame for mishandling a situation, getting us into a war that we were not prepared to win. Uh, that will that bit us back economically, caused a great deal of suffering, well, horrible loss of life and catastrophic suffering in Ukraine and a great deal of suffering elsewhere, including the hunger that you mentioned in many countries. Uh, I think the Biden administration will bear a very grave burden as historians look at its role in this, in the future. By the way, uh, Trump said to Zelensky a long time ago, uh, cut the best deal you can with Putin. And politically, perhaps that wasn't a, a course that it was possible for Zelensky to pursue at the time. But now he's going to get a much worse deal than if he had done that, unfortunately. I want to just raise one other point, and that is the perception that has led NATO countries in the United States to so avidly uh, support Ukraine against Russia. Many on the presupposition often uh, voiced by Baltic countries, Lithuania and so forth. If you don't stop Putin here, he, he'll go on. And former Secretary Mike Pompeo just said that the other day. We're fighting for America in Ukraine because Putin will try to restore the Soviet empire if he's not stopped here. Now, it's not only Americans or uh, Europeans who are saying this. I, I refer to Mikhail uh, Krasyanov, who's in the Russian opposition, but had been Putin's prime minister from 2000 to 2004. Let me quote from him. Uh, if he, Putin, is allowed to conquer some territories in Europe and the US end up swallowing the fact, he will simply keep going forward, unquote. What do you think? Well, I can't read Putin's mind, but what I think is that the Germans should have never given up conscription. Uh, when you were in the Reagan administration, they had an army of 1.2 million people and a thousand main battle tanks. Uh, they were probably the best army and certainly the best army in Europe. Now they've got a couple hundred thousand, you know, um, and maybe a hundred operational tanks. They're a joke. The French army, I'm told, reliably has ammunition for a week of combat. British army is a shadow of what it used to be, and it was never much of a land army. So the Europeans are reaping the consequences of their own silly pacifism and belief in the end of history. Uh, they need to create a deterrence, which will make sure Putin doesn't do that. I don't think the American public is going to want to send tens of thousands of American soldiers to fight in Europe against Russia nor should we have to. 
Europeans are perfectly capable of this. Russia is no longer that big a country. It doesn't have the manpower reserves. So, so it, it too has a demographic problem. No, ab absolutely. So a serious effort by, look at the polls, the point Edward Lutlack has made. They're, they're buying F-35s for show and coastal vessels, but they don't have conscription. The Finns have conscription. Finland is a small country, but they can put 300,000 soldiers in the field if they have to. The Russians are not going to mess with the Finns because the Finns will fight. The first thing that the Poles should do is reintroduce conscription and put people under arms and arm and train them properly. We need that kind of deterrence. Well, as you know, uh, NATO is now talking about expanding greatly this rapid reaction force, which I believe currently is supposed to be 40,000 troops to more than 300,000 troops. Yes, I read that. I'd like to see the details. Where are they going to come from? And how are we going to get them without conscription? So that's a lot of soldiers. It's a lot of soldiers. And, and like you, I, as I followed the expansion of NATO from 1991, when it was 16 members, uh, up to 30 members, the expansion of NATO seemed to principally serve as an excuse to disarm by its member nations. Exactly. exactly. As, you, as you just pointed out, because after all, uh, Russia is, is no longer a threat. They thought to, to some extent, though so what, what is this expanding defense alliance defending against? If not Russia, uh, so we'll just rely on the United States, leading to this anomalous situation after uh, Russia invades Ukraine, that we have to send 12,000 troops over there. We're sending 12,000 troops. They're not going to fight there. No, no, I understand that. But just to reassure the, the members of uh, the, the NATO countries uh, that we have their back uh, because they, they don't have their own backs, as you just pointed out. So one, one salutary uh, result of this disastrous war may be that NATO finally takes itself seriously. Well, let's see what the Germans and French do. Uh, if the, uh, Nothing would please me more than to see a return of Bavflicht and conscription to Germany and the, the sourcing of a thousand main battle tanks again, plus the required aircraft. Uh, I do not know if this yuppie tree-hugging generation of Germans is up for that, though. Uh, have to be convinced. And they have that choice, or they can depend on the United States, which is not going to fight a land war in Europe against Russia, uh, or they can uh, be beholden to Putin. Let me just close with one, one last very quick question. What is your opinion of this prospective membership of Finland and Sweden in NATO? I'm surprised the Swedes would give it neutrality. I'm not sure what they gain from it. They produce their own arms. They have their own military tradition. The Finns um, clearly want a, a tripwire. Uh, you have to hand it to the Finns. I mean, they are tough. They fought the uh, Russians brilliantly in 1940 in the Winter War, uh, but they still have, you know, apart from Israel and Switzerland, they have one of the best reserve military programs in the world. So uh, what I respect the Finns, and if they think that being part of NATO would uh, uh, help their effort, then you know, they, they probably know that better than I do. Well, great. I, I'm afraid we're out of time, and I would like to thank our speaker, David Goldman, for addressing the question of the economic consequences of the Russia-Ukraine war. I invite our audience to go to the Westminster Institute website, where you'll find many other uh, Westminster lectures by David Goldman, uh, under the titles which I mentioned in the introduction, as well as other speakers on this subject of Russia and Ukraine, China, Taiwan, the Middle East, and other uh, vital national security questions. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Robert Riley.